Well, welcome back, everybody. This is the second day of the 50th anniversary conference of the Center for Process Studies. Yesterday, we looked at various perspectives with respect to reimagining religion, uh, themes that are related to process theologies in the 21st century. And today, we're going to switch gears. We're going to look into science and philosophy, nature and the nature of reality. And I'm particularly looking forward to this first session and have the privilege of introducing <clears throat> our moderator, a friend of uh, the Center for Process Studies, Dr. Timothy Eastman, is a retired senior scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center with more than 40 years of experience in research and consulting in space physics, space science data systems, space weather, plasma applications, public outreach and education, and philosophy of science. Dr. Eastman's interest in philosophy and in philosophy of science extend over three decades with several journal publications in philosophy and in addition to a SUNY volume, um, an excellent volume. He's on the International Advisory Board for the Process Studies and was leader of, phys uh, excuse me, editor of Physics and Speculative Philosophy with De Gruyter Press in 2016. Uh, news of his recent volume, Untying the Gordian Knot, Process, Reality, and Context, continues to spread. If you have interest, we have it for sale in the back. It's a really inspiring read. And he's the ideal moderator, I would say, for this session on physics and metaphysics. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Eastman. Morning. Well, I'm pleased to uh, introduce to each of these three uh, fine speakers who I see each as exemplars of helping us towards initiating a new natural philosophy for the 21st century that is so much needed. And I will then start with uh, Dr. Joseph Pettick, who is chief archivist and associate editor at the Whitehead Research Project. He received his doctorate in religion and process studies from Claremont School of Theology in 2022. He's the chief archivist of the Whitehead Research Project and associate series editor for the critical edition of Whitehead. He has co-edited three books on Whitehead, Rethinking Whitehead Symbolism, 2017, Whitehead at Harvard, 20, 1924 to 25, 2020, and the Harvard Lectures of Alfred North Whitehead, 1925 to 27, General Metaphysical Problems of Science in 2021. And he's author, author of Unearthing the Unknown Whitehead, 2022, well, I need to get that one. Uh, but I've just enjoyed each of these materials and look forward to the continuing Whitehead Research Project outputs. Uh, uh, and with that, let's welcome Dr. Joe Pettit. First, I should say that by sheer coincidence, I was hired by the Whitehead Research Project of the Center for Process Studies on February 1st, 2013. That means that I've been with the center just a little over 10 years. Uh, at the time, I never imagined I'd be with CPS this long, but I'm delighted that it's worked out that way. Yesterday was also Whitehead's 162nd birthday. He was born on February 15th, 1861. Now, since this panel is all about physics and metaphysics, I thought I'd take the opportunity to do something I've been interested in doing for a while now, which is to look at the prospect of undertaking a new analysis of the compositional history of the single most important book in process metaphysics ever written, Whitehead's Process and Reality. I say new analysis because we'd be standing on the shoulders of giants in the field of Whitehead studies, most notably Victor Lowe, who was Whitehead student and biographer, and Lewis Ford, who was the founding editor of the Process Studies Journal. Both of these men did enormously important work on this topic between 40 and 60 years ago, and yet there are some new and upcoming resources that could make a real difference in building on this legacy. So my goal with this presentation is, I think, fairly modest. I want to provide a general overview of Lowe's and Ford's work on process and reality, identify a few shortcomings, describe some of the recent discoveries that may help us gain new insight into the book's composition, and then talk a bit about where we might go from here. What I'm aiming to provide then is a starting point for further work yet to be done rather than any real conclusions. Hopefully you'll all find it interesting nonetheless. <clears throat> 
The story of the first work done into process and reality's compositional history begins with Lowe, who wrote an article titled Whitehead Skifford Lectures in 1969, the first effort by anyone to give an account of the writing of what would become Whitehead's most famous book. It was based largely on Whitehead's letters to his son, North, and to others. Whitehead was invited to give the Giffords in early 1927, in the middle of his third year teaching at Harvard. He accepted about a month later and told his friend Kemp Smith that the lectures would be titled The Concept of Organism. He then spent the summer of 1927 between his third and fourth year teaching at Harvard, working on his Giffords. And in a letter to his son dated August 22nd, about a month before his Harvard classes were to begin again, Whitehead said, I have written nearly half a book on metaphysics this summer. I, I've now got nearly nine and a half chapters finished out of her projected plan of 20 or 25 chapters. Importantly for what comes next, Lowe then wrote the following about this letter. It is hopeless, indeed a mistake, to ask just which chapters of the book are substantially the nine and a half chapters that Whitehead wrote in his intensive summer's work. Nor can we know what he tackled next. No manuscripts of the book or of the lectures at Edinburgh survived. It is certain that, that what now seems to us to be the most logical order of the contents of process and reality, or the best order in which to read them, would not, even if we could agree on these matters, reveal Whitehead's actual order of writing. If anyone has full notes of what Whitehead said in his Harvard lectures and seminaries in 1927 to 28, they may shed a little light on it. The next development into the work on process and reality's compositional history took place six years later in 1975, when indeed a set of lecture notes covering the 1927 to 28 academic year was discovered, the year leading up to Whitehead's delivery of his Gifford lectures in June 1928. Nonetheless, Lowe's October 1975 letter to Ford was decidedly negative about the prospect that these new notes would be any help. Here's some of what he said about it. The second and third lectures in the first term state eight of process and reality's categories of explanation. The rest of the categorical scheme isn't stated. Probably he had made a draft of it in the summer, but wanted to talk to his students instead of losing them with its formal presentation. The genesis of the philosophy isn't represented in his lectures, and in the absence of manuscripts and journals, the genesis of the book can't be discovered. So Lowe believed that Whitehead had made a draft of the categorical scheme in the summer and then simplified or truncated it for his students. The thing is, I don't believe that this explanation actually makes much sense. Consider that his Harvard lectures, Whitehead called these eight categories principles rather than categories, and that he presented them in a different order. The eight principles that he presented to his students would become categories 1, 2, 4, 19, 7, 8, 9, and 18. While Lowe's explanation is technically possible, I don't really see why Whitehead would not only truncate things so heavily for his students, but even present these principles in a different order than he would in the finished product. The simpler explanation is that he was presenting what he had. As a speculative aside, I'll point out that the second sentence of Whitehead's published categorical scheme is the following. The whole of the subsequent discussion in these lectures has the purpose of rendering this summary intelligible. This to me suggests that Whitehead may well have seen the categorical scheme chapter as a kind of outline which he was continually tweaking and expanding as the book itself was being written. I'm sure that the many people here who have written books can attest that an introduction which serves to summarize its contents is often the very last thing to be written or else the last thing to be altered. And indeed, Ford's reaction was much like my own. Accompanying Lowe's letter, we also have four pages of Ford's preliminary notes on the lectures titled Possible article, Whitehead's Philosophical Development, 1926 to 1929. In it, he writes, I'm skeptical that this represents only a partial list of Whitehead's principles. I suspect we can see a genetic development here. I agree with Ford about this. Ford then goes on to briefly sketch an idea for himself of analyzing the development of Whitehead's philosophy from six principles that had been listed in the notes of George Birch for the 1926 to 27 academic year to eight listed by Marvin for 1927 to 28 to the finished form of process and reality. As it turns out, Ford would indeed end up writing an article and a book on this topic. But before doing that, he would in 1977 publish an article entitled Whitehead's First Metaphysical Synthesis in which he dipped his toes into the kind of textual analysis upon which he was seeking to embark with process and reality. The article claimed in brief 
that three key passages in Whitehead's book, Science in the Modern World, would be demonstrated to be later insertions, and that an analysis of these insertions reveals an interesting shift in his philosophy and its development, namely Whitehead's realization that time is atomic rather than continuous. Lowe was appalled by Ford's article, which he saw as utterly lacking in evidence and justification. In an article published the following year titled Ford's Discovery About Whitehead, Lowe wrote the following deeply sarcastic and scornful paragraph. Ford's article requires a preface. It would say, the reader must bear in mind that at the present time no documents are available to confirm or refute any part of the history here presented. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, the manuscript or typescript from which Whitehead read out the lectures which constituted his first metaphysical synthesis is not extant, nor any transcript of what he said, nor substantial notes taken by a member of his audience. Of the book, there are, I believe, no manuscripts, typescripts, galley proofs, or page proofs. Also, to the best of my knowledge, there is no notebook of Whitehead's or a diary covering the period I deal with, nor have any letters turned up in which he tells how he is expanding lectures into the book. If any of these materials were known to exist, I should, of course, have consulted them. <laughs> Lowe went on to spell out that Ford had presented these supposed three insertions as, quote, sheer fact, when such a thing could only ever be guesswork, and expressed his opinion that, quote, narratives that rest on e external evidence are the only kind that can be of lasting help in understanding Whitehead's deposition, Lowe's final dig on Ford is in the penultimate paragraph in the article when he says that, quote, Ford is too courageous. But Ford, as it turns out, was not much discouraged by Lowe's criticism. <laughs> he felt he had something and would not be put off it. That same year, in 1978, he published an article in Process Studies entitled Some Proposals Concerning the Composition of Process and Reality. It was 12 pages in total and constituted Ford's preliminary sketch of the order in which he believed process and reality had been composed, along with his methods and justification for undertaking such a task. Much of it has to do with det detecting insertions via internal contradictions in the text, and also what Ford called ghost references, that is, places in which the Macmillan edition referred to erroneous or non-existent sections. He also pointed to some external evidence in the notes of Birch and Marvin, though he characterized it as meager and disappointing. And then, in the middle, Ford wrote this paragraph just before laying out his preliminary outline of process and reality's composition. I mentioned these anomalies, ghost references, and examples of rearrangement not in order to justify some one definitive order of composition, but to indicate why I think the determination of that order is largely possible. It had been my intention in recent years to publish just such a study, but now I am persuaded this sort of analysis can best be pursued cooperatively. Thus, in this essay, I wish merely to propose a provisional outline of the stages in the composition of process and reality in the hopes that it might elicit alternate hypotheses, all of which need to be tested against each other. Specific suggestions as to insertions need to be scrutinized by minds more skeptical than mine, for while there may be some later insertions in the text, there need not be nearly as many as I want to imagine. This is an invitation for all those interested to contact me whether or not they have any specific contributions to make. It may be possible to establish an informal newsletter or summer workshop with the eventual aim of publishing our results. As it turned out, in the end, no one accepted Ford's invitation of a collaboration on his project. Ford himself said that it needed, quote, minds more skeptical than mine, but perhaps all the other scholars who had the necessary expertise agreed with Lowe that Ford was being too courageous or else they were simply too busy with their own philosophical projects. Regardless, six years later in 1984, or about 40 years ago now, Ford published his landmark book, The Emergence of Whitehead's Metaphysics, with no co-authors. In essence, it was an expansion of the articles Ford had published in the late 70s, which sought to trace the line of Whitehead's philosophical development, starting from the composition of science in the modern world and culminating in Ford's analysis of the compositional order of process and reality, including the contents of the nine and a half chapters that Whitehead had referenced to his son, North, in the summer of 1927. It should be no surprise that Ford's book drew a great deal of interest, and contemporary reviews of the book showed much excitement. Some were wholly complimentary. One review by Forrest Wood Jr. calls it the most important textual analysis of Whitehead's writings ever done, and that after Ford's work, no interpretation of a passage in science in the modern world or in process and reality will be complete without noting the passage's relation to the stratum from which it comes. Others were more skeptical. John Lango's review, for example, presented a detailed rebuttal to Ford's assertion that a particular passage in process and reality is a later insertion, 
After laying out his argument, Lango wrote, this detailed examination of an example should well illustrate the enormous difficulty of the burden Ford has taken upon himself and the indeed provisional and partial character of his results. Moreover, his discussion of this example is particularly significant because he has made his reasoning here so explicit. More often, he merely reports his results without giving his reasoning or merely adumbrates his reasoning, leaving the reader to fill in the gaps. If Ford plans to publish a sequel, I would suggest that he devote an entire chapter to an explanation of his method of compositional analysis, as in the present book there are only a few pages, and that he make much more explicit the steps and reasoning using that method that lead him to the results he reports. In the end, we can safely characterize books, Ford's book Emergence as a highly important and yet deeply controversial book, one that scholars have continued to wrestle with even to the present day. For example, Paul Bogard wrote in his 2017 introduction to the first volume of Harvard Lectures that they seemed to disprove Ford's temporal atomism thesis, while Ronnie Desmet, in a book ch chapter published in 2020, argues the opposite, that Harvard, the Harvard Lectures seemed to show that Ford's theory was correct. Now, I'm sure that I'm already getting low on time, but finally, with these preliminaries out of the way, I can talk a bit about some new developments and possible approaches to a project somewhat like Ford's. One thing that's changed in the ensuing years, which I want to stress, is that the first two volumes of Whitehead's Harvard lectures have been published, which cover Whitehead's first three years of teaching at Harvard, and they provide a far more robust picture of these lectures than either Lowe or Ford ever provided. In some cases, this was because they simply never saw sets of notes that we were later able to discover, including the notes of Winthrop Pickard Bell and Fritz Jules Rothesberger. In other cases, both Lowe and Ford had access to more complete sets of notes yet underutilized them or did not utilize them at all, as was the case for the notes of George Perigo Conger and Sinclair Kirby Miller. I can only guess as to why these resources were not better employed at the time, but it may partly have to do with accessibility and legibility. The notes of Birch and Marvin that both Lowe and Ford seemed to lean on the most heavily in their analyses had been typed up by the original note takers. The notes of Conger and Kirby Miller were handwritten in full obscure shorthand not to mention that I suspect that at times Ford and Lowe were trying to work with nearly illegible photocopies. 1970s Xerox machines did not always provide the best quality. Regardless, having edited the second volume of Whitehead's Harvard Lectures myself, I find Ford's reliance on Birch's notes for his analyses to be somewhat appalling. Ford characterizes these in his emergence as, quote, a very good set of student notes for the 1926 to 27 academic year. In my view, these are one of the absolute worst sets of notes that we have. Birch usually did not record more than about 150 words per lecture and skipped a great many altogether. Conger, by contrast, routine, re routinely recorded over 1,000 words per lecture. Also, we have more than 300 pages of notes from Conger and only 14 from Birch. Here is how Birch's notes were characterized in our introduction to HL2 published in 2021. The first 11 pages are not dated at all and have some headings which turn out on closer inspection to be misleading. For instance, the first two pages are titled Lectures by Professor Whitehead, Introduction, which one would think was Whitehead's first lecture of the term, but in fact these first two pages contain material from three lectures, the first, third, and fourth of the term. Without other notes to compare them to, one would never know that Birch had summarized the content from three non-consecutive lectures together. We never use Birch's notes as our primary account. They are simply too brief to be of much use. Suffice to say that we now have a much better picture of Whitehead's Harvard lectures than we've ever had before, which is already giving us some real insights into his philosophical development that we never could have guessed before now. One example that relates specifically to process and reality is the influence of C.D. Broad, who Whitehead only mentioned once in his books in a footnote to the principle of relativity and yet whose books we now know were assigned reading for Whitehead students for at least the first seven years of his Harvard tenure. In fact, that Whitehead ended up framing process and reality as, quote, an essay in speculative philosophy may be attributed partially to Broad, who in the mid-1920s made much of a distinction between what he called critical philosophy versus speculative philosophy, a distinction which Whitehead made a point of discussing in some detail with his students. However, it's true that I'm jumping the gun a little when it comes to the prospect of possibly undertaking a new analysis of process and reality's compositional history. What we need now is for the third volume of Harvard Lectures to be published, as it will include notes for the academic years directly before and directly after Whitehead's delivery of his Giffords in June 1928. It will again include, no include notes which Lowe and Ford either never knew about or vastly underutilized. 
and I have little doubt that it will turn out to be the most important single tool at our disposal for doing the kind of analysis Ford was attempting. This is not to mention that technology has also made our job much easier than it was 40 years ago. The power and ease of word processing software and keyword searching is not to be underestimated. But the real question here at the end is whether a compositional analysis of process and reality similar to the one Ford did is even a viable and worthwhile thing to attempt. Lowe didn't think so. Neither did Ivor Leclerc and a lot of other process scholars who were worried about reading more into the text than was actually there and insisted on relying solely on external evidence. Ford, by contrast, was, to use Lowe's phrase, almost certainly too courageous. In a 1981 review of the corrected edition of Process and Reality, he even discussed the possibility of a revised edition, a radical reconstruction that would adopt Whitehead's final terminological usage, for instance, as the preferred one. Ford admitted that this was not yet feasible and bound to be controversial, and yet almost no one today, I suspect, myself included, would think this was a good idea. My belief is that the best answer to this question of a new compositional analysis of process and reality, as is so often the case, lies somewhere between these two extreme points of view. Ford's problem, which he himself admitted, was, was that he needed, quote, minds more skeptical than mine to keep him from taking things too far, which was something he never really got. George R. Lucas, Jr., who, was working with, who has worked with Brian Henning and I in the critical edition, wrote a lot about Ford's work in the 80s and characterized it this way. The major defect of Ford's project is the highly conjectural nature of the conclusions drawn from it in the absence of any corroborative primary source documents, coupled with the tendentious and decisive manner with which highly speculative con conclusions are frequently presented. Indeed, in reading Ford's emergence, he often refers to the, quote, Giffords draft as if it were a physical document in his possession rather than merely an imaginative reconstruction. No wonder the whole thing ended up being so controversial. Lowe, meanwhile, was not courageous enough. For as much trouble as Ford arguably got himself into by not adequately justifying his conclusions, there is nothing wrong with making the attempt as long as one is appropriately ruthless in rooting out anything even remotely speculative, or at least labeling speculation appropriately. Because there are, in fact, a lot of things that Ford pointed out in his analysis that really aren't controversial, or at least shouldn't be. I'll give one easy example, which unfortunately is all I have time for. I'll wager that there are people here who don't know or don't remember that Whitehead laid out a category of reversion in this categorical scheme on page 26 of the corrected edition, and then later on, on page 250, explicitly abolished that category. This is literally Whitehead contradicting himself in his own text. Hence, there can be no controversy over the fact that this portion of the categorical scheme was written before the later section in which it was abolished, and that Whitehead simply could not be bothered to comb through his manuscript and remove any references to a concept that became irrelevant in the process of his writing the book. So what we need, I think, is a new book that provides a definitive list of such inconsistencies without resorting to the kind of undue speculation that Ford was prone to do. His emergence has proved over the last four decades to be an enormous stimulus, but it is fatally flawed. He was too courageous and not skeptical enough. What is needed is a book that is as uncontroversial as possible, which scholars can reference with confidence. As I've already said, the time to do this would be in the wake of the publication of the third volume of Harvard Lectures, as this will provide the easiest access to the best possible external evidence that we are ever likely to have for such an endeavor. You may consider this presentation of mine to also be an invitation to potential collaborators, just like the one Ford made in 1978. We've still got some years ahead of us before HL3 is even published to think on it, but I believe it would, will, it would be a worthwhile challenge to embark upon. Thank you.